But if we can all stand in this place and lift up our hands and begin to talk to God, begin to give Him the glory and the honor that He is worthy of. We serve a great God. The psalmist said, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Right now, I wonder if you know that we serve a great God. You will lift up your hands and begin to call upon that name, that great name of Jesus. God, we praise you, Lord, while we speak of your glorious and your great works, God. Lord, you are great and you are greatly to be praised, Jesus. God, we will bless your name forever and ever, God. Lord, every day I will bless thee, Jesus. I will praise that name among the heathens. Hallelujah, Lord, we praise you.
I just have a shout of praise for him. God, you are worthy of all the glory, all the honor, God, and all the praise. You don't know everything that God has brought me from, but I thank God that he has helped me, that God has delivered me. He is a healer tonight. There are needs we want to bring before the Lord. We want to remember Gabe's co-worker, Jessica, that God would give her a complete healing in her body. So remember Sister Georgia in our prayers tonight. And Brother John, let's take these needs before the Lord. God, we pray and come unto you, God, with faith, Jesus. Lord, knowing, God, that you are able, God. We pray, Jesus, that you would touch these needs, that you would touch Jessica, God. You would touch Gabe's co-worker, give her a complete healing in her body, Lord. We pray for Sister Georgia, God, that you would touch your situation, touch her need, God. Lord, I pray that you would touch Brother John tonight, Lord. You know the need, the circumstance, God. We pray that every hand that was lifted, Lord, every need that is in this house, God, that you were able to do that and much more to meet that need, God. We give you the glory and the honor and the thanks for it, God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, God. Let's remember this Friday night, all of our students say 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock prayer starts for our youth service this Friday night. And I'm encouraging each and every one of you, be there prompt at 7 o'clock for prayer. God will meet us there. 7 o'clock prayer, 7.30, service starts. We're inviting all the church, our parents, everybody to come out, support our young people. Please be there. Every, fr every Friday, every week that I text the young people, and about the youth service, I always tell them, come with great expectation. And not one time has, have we ever left there with our expectations not met, with God not meeting uh, with us in that service. So come expecting great things on Friday night. And then Saturday, 2 p.m. around here is the Arizona Kids Rally. 
there will be a, a time and a service for them. And then there's going to be bouncy castles and a great time of fun and food for them afterwards. It's right here at the church at 2 o'clock Saturday. And then ladies, mark your calendars for Monday, April 12th. It's a ladies' minute to win it game night. It's going to be a blast for all of our ladies. I'm sure there's probably some that are competitive that are starting to prepare and uh, looking to win. So that will be a great time. And then youth convention, April 15th through the 16th in Tucson, Victor Jackson preaching. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a great time. I know that God is going to use Brother Jackson in a great way and bring a powerful word to that service. At this time, I invite you to come and give in worship and tithe and offering tonight. You can give in person. If you join us on live stream, you can text to give. Greet each other in the name of the Lord.
all been glorified all over this house right now. He is worthy, he is powerful, and he is great. I love you. touch of the presence of God in this house tonight. I'm extremely thankful for it. Your pastor needed the presence of the Lord that's in this house tonight. Aren't you thankful God's among us tonight? Amen. I'll let you be seated tonight. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Middle of the week, I just recently saw a church that a friend of my pastors, they've started calling their midweek recharge. And I really like that because it seems like about midweek, you just sort of fill in the cares of the world and the day. And you come in and you get recharged with the presence of the Lord and the Word of God. It's a good thing. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen. It's so good to have the Felties back home after his extended trip with his job. Glad they are back. Amen. And uh, going to launch into probably a three-part series tonight. I'm going to have Brother Zach Cleveland come read the text. I'll let you remain seated. Uh, You've been standing all night anyways. And it is a lengthy passage, a lengthy passage as a scripture. want him to come and read this. If, if you have lived for God any length of time or been around Pentecostal circles, you have heard the phrase, the unpardonable sin. Have you ever heard that? You've heard that. Next question. How many of you at some point in your walk with God, the enemy planted the thought in your mind, oh my goodness, did I just commit the unpardonable sin? All you perfect people out there need to fess up right now. I tell you that right now. And so we're we're gonna we're gonna it seems like that is such a ploy and tactic of the enemy. You may you may have found mercy and grace and forgiveness, but they say, no, you did it eight times instead of seven times, so it doesn't count, and you've committed the unpardonable sin. You are on the straight path to the lake of fire. Do not pass go, do not collect two hundred dollars. And so we're gonna Over the next three weeks, because it is a heavy subject, we are going to cover this in depth and hopefully eradicate any idea in your mind that you're lost and that you're too far gone and help us understand what blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is. Brother Zach Cleveland, if you'd come and read uh, while he's coming, you can turn to the first one, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, chapter 22, we're going to read through verse 37. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges." But if I cast out the devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of his good treasure 
of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of an evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Next portion of scripture is from Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and the prince of the devils cast he out devils. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost uh, hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnations, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit." Luke, 10, Luke 12 and verse 10. Luke 12 and verse 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Last portion of Scripture in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 verse 16 and 17. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I believe there's been a great strength come to the church. What we covered, I think it was the last two or three weeks, uh, what we covered in depth and uh, into some of these meteor subjects. And I believe it's going to do the very same thing here as well as we talk about the unpardonable sin. It'll take us about three weeks to get through all of it. One of the great themes of the Bible, and we all love it, is that of forgiveness of sins. We know from the Word of God that every one of us, it matters not your background, we've all sinned and we come short of the glory of God. And because of that, we desperately need the forgiveness of God in our life. Without it, it does not matter when the sins occurred or whatever the nature, you and I would be completely lost with no hope at all. But I'm thankful God provided a remedy for us through the incarnation, that is through God robing himself in flesh. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful event for us. And then his death on Calvary. It was a very human death on Calvary. And because of that, the blood of Jesus now cleanses us from all of our sin. And forgiveness of sin is available to everyone even for the most vile of sins. Look at Ephesians 1 and 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Look at Colossians 1 and 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 2 and 13. And you being dead in your, in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. First John 2 and 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Is anyone thankful for the blood of Jesus that washes away all our sins tonight? Thank God for the blood. When we repent of our sins and we are baptized in the name of Jesus 
our sins, they are remitted or they are washed away. Acts 2 and 38 tells us we are baptized for the remission of our sins. And then Acts 22 and 16, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Our sins are not remitted at repentance. They are washed away by the blood at the point of baptism in the name of Jesus. And then God promised in Acts chapter 2 that after we repent and are baptized, we shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Salvation from sin is God's greatest provision for mankind. We need His mercy. We need His grace to escape eternity in hell. But thank God He provided a way to do it. Would you say amen tonight? Tonight's lesson is going to be very foundational to the following two. Let me continue now. Forgiveness of sins, it must be a priority for us. That's why in your daily prayer time, repentance should be a daily part of your prayer life and a part of your daily life as well. And Jesus expressed this desire of forgiveness of sins. Uh, it's expressed as important when he began to teach about the unpardonable sin. Obtaining forgiveness is so important that if we do not receive forgiveness of sins, then we are hopelessly and helplessly doomed for all of eternity. This topic we're covering tonight and the next two weeks on the unpardonable sin, it is, it is a serious topic because once this one is committed, there is no coming back. God's Word says what it means, and it means what it says. It is a serious topic, but there is hope for Jesus made it clear in Matthew 12 and 31 that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men except blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. He said in Mark 3, 28 and 29, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sins unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherever, wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. But he that blasphemes shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And yes, our topic revolves around a sin that cannot be forgiven. However, it is important for us, especially when the enemy places that lie in your mind uh, that you have committed this sin of, of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's important to combat that lie from the enemy that we understand the far-reaching effects of God's forgiveness. I already mentioned it tonight. I'll state it again. One of, God's, one of Satan's most effective weapons against us is to make us feel we have sinned so badly that God will not forgive us. Has anyone ever been there? You fall into that same trap over and over, uh, and guess what? The enemy is very faithful. He is very faithful to remind you of your fault and your failure and tell you, man, you blew it again this week. Uh, that's the seventh time uh, you have exceeded the mercies of God. But I want to tell you from the Word of God, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, nothing could be further from, unscript from an unscriptural idea than this concept that we are too wicked to be forgiven. Uh, there's not a sin too dirty. There's not a sinner too far gone. If we need forgiveness for anything, for any sin, except for blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, we can throw ourselves into the mercies of God that are new each and every morning and say, God, will you forgive me? And God does not scratch his head and say, let me think about it. But the Word of God tells me that God abundantly pardons our sins. That's why we're sitting here tonight looking into the Word of God and feeling the Word of God, not because I've been perfectly righteous all my life, but because I've experienced mercy and I experience grace and I live a life of repentance. There is forgiveness of sin. Look at Isaiah 55 and 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Is anyone thankful for the mercy and the grace of God? Would you give him praise right now? Thank you, Lord. 
one of the major ploys of the enemy, especially with new converts and, and young peoples, to make them think at some point they have blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. Therefore, it's useless for them to, for, for them to try to seek out God's mercy and forgiveness. And that's exactly why we're covering this subject. That's why we're talking about it. I want to put something in your spirit tonight. Uh, that when the enemy comes knocking on your door and saying, Luke, uh, you've blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. Uh, you don't have to think about it. You can stand upon the Word of God and say, it is written and he must flee from you. Uh, we want to be aware of the devices of the enemy. Amen. So let's look at some of the definitions of this phrase, blasphemy or blaspheming the Holy Ghost. We must understand what it means. We must understand what blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is. And we must also understand and comprehend who the Holy Ghost is in order to have the proper reverence and fear of God and not commit this unpardonable sin. The word blasphemy, along with the words blaspheme, blasphemed, blasphemer, blasphemeth, blasphemies, and blasphemous comes from the following Greek words. The first, blasphemio, means to vilify, to defame, to rail on, to revile, or to speak evil. The next Greek word is blasphemia, which means vilification, especially against God, evil speaking and railing. The third one is blasphemous, which means uh, scurrilous, calumnious, impious, and railing. Webster's defines the words blaspheme as speaking of sacred things in terms of irreverence, to revile or to speak reproach, reproachfully of God or anything sacred, to speak evil of, to utter abuse or slander against. Webster further defines the word blasphemy as profane or mocking speech, writing or actions concerning God or anything regarded as sacred. Contempt for God. And the meaning of blasphemy becomes very obvious from these, des, uh, from these definitions. It is speaking against and railing against the Holy Ghost. So that is the definition of blaspheme or blasphemy. The other term in that phrase is the Holy Ghost. It's vital for us. It's important for us to know the one thing we are to refrain from blaspheming against. And blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is the only unpardonable sin. It's the only sin God will not forgive. And so it's important for us to, to understand and define the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. There are many false concepts and teachings floating around about the Holy Ghost. And so with all of those opinions about the Holy Ghost, uh, I say let's go to the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the final authority on all things. Amen. And so from the Word of God, this is what we know about the Holy Ghost. I'll define it from the Word of God. First of all, the Holy Ghost is the Father of Jesus Christ. The Holy, I thought I was in a oneness church. The Holy Ghost is the Father of Jesus Christ. From Matthew chapter 1, 18 and 20, states that Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost. Luke 1 and 35, an angel speaks to Mary that the Holy Ghost would come upon her and she would become pregnant. The second thing we know about the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ baptizes men with the Holy Ghost. Is there a witness of that in the house today? Luke chapter 3 and verse 16, speaking of Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John 1, 30 and 3 states that Jesus uh, will baptize with the Holy Ghost. Acts 1 and 5, Jesus states, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And so being baptized with the Holy Ghost, it's synonymous with these phrases from the Word of God. It's synonymous with being filled with the Holy Ghost. It's synonymous with the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's synonymous with receiving the Holy Ghost. It's synonymous with the Holy Ghost coming upon us, the Holy Ghost being poured out upon us, the Holy Ghost falling on us, and the Holy Ghost being shed upon us. The third thing we know about the Holy Ghost from the Word of God 
is that there are three that bear record in heaven. Look at 1 John 5 and 7. I know you're saying, let's get to the part of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. This is a foundation for all of that. So we know that there's three that bear record in heaven, 1 John 5 and 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Someone say, praise the Lord. The fourth thing we know about the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost is a teacher. Before you receive the Holy Ghost, you probably scratch your head about some of our, our habits and disciplines in our life. But after you got the Holy Ghost, it began to teach you some things. It changed your nature. Look at 1 Corinthians 2 and 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Note, the Holy Ghost teacheth. Look at Luke 12 and 12. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. The Holy Ghost will teach you. John 14 and 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Look what he will do. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Fifth, about the Holy Ghost, our bodies, your body, my body, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Therefore, I can't live any way I want to, because I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. First Peter 1 and 12 lets us know that the Holy Ghost was sent down from heaven to people. Hebrews 6 lets us know we are partakers of the Holy Ghost. Romans 5 and Acts 2 lets us know that the Holy Ghost is given unto us. Is there anyone thankful that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? That means the Holy Ghost is living inside of you tonight. The sixth thing about the Holy Ghost we learn is the Holy Ghost makes people overseers of the flock, the church of God. Acts 20 and verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. I truly believe the word of God that if the man of God is in tune with God and the church of God is in tune with God, the right pastor will be given to the church for that time and that space. The seventh thing we know about the Holy Ghost is the church began on the day of Pentecost with those present being filled with the Holy Ghost. This was evidenced by them speaking in tongues uh, as the Spirit gave the utterance. And so we conclude from this, from the Scripture, that the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit. We conclude that God is a Spirit, that there is one Spirit, that the Lord is that Spirit, that we are baptized into the body, the church, by the Spirit. And the Holy Ghost is the Comforter and the Spirit of Truth. And I had to go through all that to point out it's very easy to conclude the Holy Ghost is not a sensation. It is God, the invisible, uncreated, self-existent, uh, eternal one who manifests himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when one blasphemes against the Holy Ghost, he blasphemes against the one true eternal God. That's why it's so important. There are some that erroneously teach that there are three distinct co-eternal, co-existent, and co-equal persons in the Godhead. However, now, let's, you'll have some fun with this. If this teaching were true, that God is three distinct, co-equal, co-eternal, co-equal persons in the Godhead. If this teaching were true, then when Jesus said, do not blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, he exalted the Holy Ghost above the Father and of the Son. So, therefore, they are not co-equal. But God's Word teaches us that there are not three gods, but there is only one God, and the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus Christ. Colossians 2 and 9, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead 
bodily. Colossians 1 and 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. God, who is a spirit, according to John 4, is without measure fully and entirely tabernacled in the man, Christ Jesus. That's why Paul could say to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 and 16, God was manifest in the flesh. And so that's our foundation. So we understand when one blasphemes against the Holy Ghost, it is blasphemy against the one true living God himself. That's why God takes it so seriously. But through the provision of God, he is provided by the means where we can have our sins forgiven through the blood of Calvary, and we can have his spirit, the Holy Ghost, living inside of us. Jesus is not someone I visit on Sundays and Wednesdays, but Jesus is the Holy Ghost living inside of me. I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so we can be full of the Holy Ghost. And it isn't just to make you feel good. And it's not just to get you to heaven. But it's to empower you that the works that he did on this earth, greater things than this, shall he do through you. We can be full of the Holy Ghost and great things can occur not through the power of humans but through the power of the Holy Ghost. I dare say that the the little four year olds that have been filled with the Holy Ghost they have the power inside of them to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I also dare say that you take a 93-year-old boy, uh, man, weak in body, but he's full of the Holy Ghost. He can stand against every attack of the enemy and say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and the devils have to flee because the Holy Ghost is more than talking in tongues, and it's more than an emotional experience. It is the Spirit of Jesus Christ living inside of believers. And so God takes it seriously when someone rails against himself. And so we exercise caution uh, lest we speak against the Holy Ghost. Uh, I close with this tonight. Stand with me right now. Uh, I love the way one writer, one writer of the scripture described this entire experience uh, of, of the doctrine and the, and, the, and the doctrine of one God in Christ. And there is only one God. And also the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Uh, he said it like this, Brother Felty. He said, we have this treasure. I'm going to say that again because it needs to sink in. Uh, we have this treasure. It's not just an experience. Uh, it's a treasure in earthen vessels. I think we ought to lift our hands and thank God for the Holy Ghost tonight. Oh, I feel a witness of His Spirit right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, lift your voice all over this house right now. I thank you, God, that you have filled us with your spirit. Help us to walk reverently, God. Help us to walk in the fear of God, that we do not blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. Let us be aware of Satan's devices. We're thankful for an altar that we can find forgiveness of sins. We're thankful if we're walking in the light and we confess our sins to you. Uh, you continually to cleanse us as we repent. Uh, I'm thankful you provided your spirit to live inside of us. Uh, Help me to be a proper temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Help me to walk worthily in your past and in your ways. Oh God, uh, I don't want to just go through my Christian rock slipshod. uh, But God, let me walk with fear and trembling uh, in the past that you have for me. And let us honor you and your presence uh, and this treasure, God. Let us value it as a treasure. In the name of Jesus, I pray uh, we give you praise and glory and honor. Uh, Oh, would you magnify his name tonight? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Next week we'll get into more about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost what it is not, what it is, and help us understand that a whole lot better. 
there's going to be a strength come into your walk with God. There's going to be weapons put into your spiritual arsenal when the enemy comes and says, hey, I think you've blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. You'll be able to go to the Word of God and say it is written, and the enemy cannot compete and cannot stand against the Word of God. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Get on the phone. Get someone to the house of the Lord with you on Sunday. It's going to be a great day around here. God bless you.